Coming up on this week's show, a rare Atari prototype sells at auction. Bloodborne cart is real and it's coming to the PS1. And we chat Manic Miner to Commander Conquer with Steve Weatherill. The Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each and every Friday with our good pals at Bitmap Books. Now, one of their books you should definitely check out, Sinclair ZX Spectrum, a visual compendium. Experience the Spectrum's library of games brought vividly to life using special inks in their high-quality full-color compendium, a real celebration of the visual style of the Spectrum. You can see that and the rest of their books at bitmapbooks.com. And our friends at PCBWay who offer a fully featured custom PCB prototype service with low cost, fast turnaround quality boards. And they do services like 3D printing and injection molding. And they're massive supporters of the retro community. So if you're working on a project right now, you can get an instant quote at (laughs) PCBWay.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast episode number 322, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And great to have you joining us for another episode, getting all nerdy about classic video games. Of course, we're bringing you up to speed with all the big stories over the last week, and we're going to be joined by a veteran of the industry in the second half of the show. Now, I think we should be a little bit honest here, because we are kind of cheating this week. We're recording a little bit ahead of time, because right now, Ravi is uh, sat with his feet up in business class, sipping Sancerre (laughs) on his way to America. Yeah, um, I'm going to America, but we are recording this ahead, so you get the good quality and then uh next week you can get the kind of exciting stuff where i I think i'm going to be in san francisco and then i'll be in new york as well so those are going to be some really interesting episodes you should just do the episode on your phone like in times square (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) just going about his day on the subway with a laptop trying to do the research (laughs) (laughs) um, (laughs) stories yeah, but um, also I have I have been preparing for an event which is coming up, which is a Workbench 2022 as well in um, England, and that's in Chipping Sobbury. And what I'm going to be doing is pretty awesome. So you know I do that um, old school DJing with uh, Amiga computers. Well, yeah. I'm going to be DJing, and uh, we're going to have a battle with the legendary DJ Hoffman. So I've been going through tunes and trying to pick a wicked selection because this is like the premier kind of amiga event in the uk it's the biggest one and this is a mm. run by swag which is a southwest amiga group and they're and they're pretty huge now like i think the last one we went to this was a pre-pandemic there was there was about 100 people there so you're gonna be doing like is it gonna be like an old school dj battle then like these like I, i'm Master not Flash sure like you, you know the day. <laughs> he he said just bring a good selection of of uh kind of tunes so i think we're gonna go through all genres and then like he picks a tune and I, I go right. I'm gonna I'm gonna match this one, or or like we do a little set and then like do a set against each other. But whatever the case, I'm determined to beat him. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, it is good things. I mean, I was at a big retro gaming event last weekend as well. You know, we've done a couple of gaming markets. We're kind of dipping our toe back into doing live events this summer, um, and obviously more of them on the way as well. I know um, hopefully going to Germany a bit later on this in the year as well. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna be you know, DJing that one as well in Germany. So uh, yeah, that should be fun. Ravi International DJ these days. There you go. Um, so, so if you want to uh, join us for any of those, I'll actually something I just realised. We used to actually put all the events that we were attending in the show notes, which I haven't done for two years. So, um, if you ever want to come to any events that we're going to be at, as uh, as we confirm them, we'll uh, we'll add those to the show notes again. So it's cool to see stuff kind of opening up and getting back out there and mingling with people. Because I imagine we're actually meeting people. Last weekend when I was at this event, you know, I met people that probably started listening to the show in the last couple of years who we've never had a chance to meet in person before because new people come along all the time so we do like getting out there and kind of uh seeing people in person it, it you know, kind of makes like it real doesn't it but like we're just sat here kind of producing a show and yeah. uh you know sending it out there and like it's like oh it just goes out there and you see numbers come back but you don't see humans <laughs> and it's good yeah. to see people actually come up and comment and talk to us it's really nice Yeah, absolutely. So we'll keep you up to date with those in our show notes and on our socials as well. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter for those. So we have got an amazing guest this week now. uh, Ravi, you were well in your element on this week's episode with uh, Steve Weatherill. Of course, you are our resident CNC fan. Oh, yeah. I absolutely love RTS games and like, uh, you know, Command and Conquer, especially. I'm absolutely addicted to it. And this week's guest, he's he's got an amazing history, you know, uh, starting kind of porting Manic Miner. 
<laughs> which yeah. which is a, a pretty amazing title. And then getting into a Jet Set Willy 2 and, um, you know, Flimbo's Quest. Do you remember that one? And uh, yeah, yeah. Myth as well. I know, I know that's a title that you absolutely love. But um, he was also like kind of technical director and uh, producer on the uh, Command and Conquer series. So for the second half of the interview, I get really stuck in there with Command and Conquer. <laughs> I just sit back and let Ravi go yeah. in the second half of this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's, he also did Dune 2000. So um, he's, he's got like a history of Dune as well and having that connection, uh, which developed Command and Conquer into that really amazing series where it was like just on the cutting of that edge of where kind of CD multimedia was really getting out there with FMV sequences, um, you know, amazing music. And uh, it all kind of came together as a complete package for me, that uh, game. And it's just amazing to talk to him about it and how it all developed. Yeah, and he's got a really interesting history. It's like you said, we kind of go, we start with this kind of 8-bit stuff because he ported stuff like, you know, Manic Miner to the Amstrad, didn't they? And Jet Set Willy. Yeah. Um, and then he worked for companies, you know, he worked with like Firebird, Telecom Soft, Denton Designs he worked with as well. Uh, Odin Computer three. Graphics as well. Yeah, there was loads of these, you know, classic British companies. And then he went to work for uh, EA and he was working on the Desert Strike series as well, wasn't he? So, you know, he's got a really interesting history and a very, very selection of games that he worked on as well. So uh, I think this is one of those interviews where there is kind of something for everyone. Yeah, totally. Like if, if you're a Specky fan, like, or Amstrad fan at the beginning, it's really interesting. And then later on, if you're into your RTSs, it gets into that. And I really like these interviews where it's like, you know, hitting multiple audiences and everyone can kind of get fun from it. Yeah, and a really, really interesting guy as well. So make sure you hang around for that. Our special guest, the wonderful Steve Weatherall, coming up in around half an hour from now. Before that, of course, first half of the show, we bring you up to speed with the big retro gaming news stories from the last week. Now, uh, I had to kind of read the title of this game a couple of times. For some reason, I kept reading Asbestos. <laughs> I, as so exactly the same. I, kept, I kept reading it as Astro Bros. Right. So, <laughs> But this is Astabros, is it? Astabros. 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 Right, I'm, okay. not too, I'm not too sure. But either way... Well, it's a new Mega Drive game, It's anyway. a new Mega Drive slash Sega Genesis game. Have you guys watched, the, watched the trailer at all? Yes. Looks really good, actually. Yeah. Um, graphically, that is... Mm. I saw it and I'm like, that is a Mega Drive game, looking at those graphics. Yeah. It looks like a really nice Mega Drive game, which I would expect in 2022, you know, 30 years after the Mega Drive's kind of heyday. Mm. Um, so this is coming out. This has been successfully... Uh, kickstarted um it's had a fifty thousand dollar goal and it got sixty five thousand dollars by the time it ended which is really cool backed by 800 backers and like you say it's, it's coming on the switch um as a digital game but then it's also getting a physical release on the sega genesis um which i think is really really cool so very similar to um paprium you know, yeah. which came out a couple of years ago, like a really, well, last year, I think it was now, a really, really nice looking Mega Drive game. But unlike Paprium, it's, it is getting the digital version on the Switch, um, which I think is really cool because that that's kind of what I needed with Paprium because I have not managed to play that because it goes for so much now. But this is a, I kind of had to look this up, <laughs> a rogue light action game. So to it's me, it's kind of like Castlevania side scrolly. Yeah, that's, from the looks of it, that's that's what it looked like to me. It just looked like a platformer kind of Castlevania game, but it isn't quite that. It looks also a little bit like Shovel Knight. It's yeah, got that yeah. real nice sixteen bit look to it, and really smooth scrolling and really smooth pixel art, which I really love. Um, but essentially, it's six stages, but these stages, um, it's a dungeon crawler game, but they are randomly generated. So mm. each time you play it, the the, the dungeon generates itself. Um, oh, that's think, nice. Which I think is really cool, you know, if they've got that running on a Mega Drive. So I'm assuming there's going to be some wizardry in the cart there. It's 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 like Paprium. There's going to be extra bits and bobs in there, um, which it, it doesn't say at the moment. Um, but we're expecting to see this in March 2023. Okay. So about 11 months, 11, 10 months from now. Um, hopefully it won't be like Paprium and we get it in like 2030. In seven years' time. <laughs> um, it looks really technically good. Like um, mm. so, so some of the backgrounds, they've got this wavy effect on one of them, which is like, you know, you usually get your parallax background, but this is yeah. kind of like, I don't know how to describe it. In in demo scene, you kind of have these like wavy, warpy textures. Yeah. Yeah. That makes me a bit queasy looking at it. Again. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's got some really highly detailed backgrounds, like, you know, 
I'm interested to see it when it comes out, you know, what, what it is going to be running on and stuff like that. Like, you know, what they what they do to the cart to get it running. Uh, but I really do love the trailer where they've got it running on a CRT at the start, which I think is really cool. Um, but there is like an RPG element to it by looks of things. There's like a levelling up kind of, you know, element and you can buy your weapons and upgrade your weapons and stuff like that. Um, and it is going to be two player. And there's three selectable characters. You can get a, a mage, a knight, or a ranger, like an archer. Um, is it just me? Is is mate? It looks like Orko from He Man. Yes, the little sorcerer that used to yeah, fly. He, That's what I thought it was. At yeah, first. he does. He does. And the knight looks like Shovel Knight. Um, yeah. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. So you know, maybe yeah, yeah. There's, there's some inspiration there. And the ranger does look like the archer from the Dungeons and Dragons games. But, but, but then for some reason, it kind of looks a bit like Darkseed to me, or it looks like a kind of like a, a, a bit darker, you know, maybe it's the, yeah. the, the, the backgrounds in there, or it looks, it's got this kind of gothic-y um, kind of look to it. You know? Yeah, it does. It has that, like you say, like goth kind of, you know, kind of Victorian. So the rogue element comes Yeah, in, Victorian it? kind of time, like look to it. Um but I really like the soundtrack. It's got that thumping, you know, Sega Mega Drive Genesis twang to it. I think they've captured that really well. Um, if you listen to it, I know obviously you guys can't listen to it right now, but it, it, it's really got that, like, I can only describe it as the twanging guitar, you know, which isn't like Road Rash and stuff. Well, the crew behind this, I mean, I'm not sure if we mentioned this game when it came out. The last game was their Demons of Asterborg that they made. Um, at the start of last year. Mm. I've got a feeling we may have talked about it. It was kind of a Metroidvania kind of game right. with uh, yeah. elements of ghouls and ghosts and rings Mickey of Mouse Castle. Yeah, and stuff rings like of that. Bell. So this is set in the same universe. Okay, cool. As that game. So it's kind of, you know, a, a sequel of sorts mm. to that game. I really like the, uh, the Mega Drive box. They've gone for the Japanese style, mm. which I think is really cool where they've got it, it's. It's down the side, and then they've actually got the MD in the red and the green, like the original Japanese Mega Drive at the top. So, I think you know, as I always say, it's it's a real labour of love, um, and you know the graphics do look really nice. And they have said, you know, if they hit the higher tiers and stuff like that, they would be, you know, the graphics would be if they would be better. Which once again for the Mega Drive, a bit of a hard one. I'm not, you know, I'm not a technical guy, so I don't know how that works. But you know, there's some. These look amazing anyway. It looks amazing anyway. But there's some, mm. there's some crazy tiers. You know, some crazy uh, things you can buy. You can for three thousand euros, you could have got your own arcade cabinet with it on. Yeah, with all the hard like, work and stuff. What one thousand five hundred? You can design a NPC for it, and like I love at the bottom, it says all content should be appropriate for the game because I just make <laughs> like a really trolly M- NPC. Yeah, Good NPC. You to do that. Yeah, NPC is a car park, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm tem- I mean, at the point of recording this, there is a couple of days left on it, and it's sixty euros for the boxed cartridge version of the game. And I'm just like, I probably should because I regretted not getting Paprium, but then it took like seven years for it to come out. So I don't know. The good thing about this though is that they're bringing it out on the Switch as well. Yeah. So if you just want to play the game, I imagine it's going to be a very similar version from what I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, if you don't want, I mean, obviously collectors want the original, you know, cartridge on a, on a Mega Drive. That's the way you want to play, you know, for real hardcore fans. But it is cool that they're opening it up to more people to be able to play it. And it's not really, like you said, Paprium looks great, but the, there's probably a handful of people in the world who've played it. Yeah, you know I mean? exactly. The average person hasn't. So, uh, and at the time recording this, like you said, I mean, when the show comes out, it'll be over. Uh, but they've already smashed their target. You know, they wanted 42. 2,124 it and it's over 61k mm. already so uh, this project's definitely happening and like you said I mean the, these are just real labours of love aren't they and you can tell how much time and love has gone into making this so I'm sure it's going to be a big success for them so we'll uh, we'll put a link to that in our show notes if you want to check out more now instead of trying to uh, track down a copy of Paprium Joe um, if you've got a spare $270,000 lying around you could have bought an Atari Home Pong prototype <laughs> That is now sell for auction. For that much money. I'll buy two. The classic. <laughs> or dad's That's like the dad price of a house, it. isn't it, pretty much? Yeah, more yeah. than. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, so um, obviously we've had um, Al Alcorn on the show before, uh, the inventor of Pong. And um, this is actually a prototype that he owned, that he sold, um, of the original home version of Pong. This one kind of made out of wood. And he's actually signed it as well. And there's a letter in there as well, talking about, you know, a certificate of authenticity he's put in there too. And I think, you know, this is, it's a very big deal. And actually, I know we kind of joked then that it's gone for, you know, $270,000. 
But this, to me, is kind of up there with something like a, like an Apple One, you know, in terms yeah. of the change in the industry. It's, that it had. it's a huge, huge kind of item. And uh, I, I, honestly, I think that's quite cheap for what it is. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, this is a, a monumental kind of time in, in video game history. And I, I remember seeing the original um, kind of Pong arcade machines and uh, you know they were they were always built out of like bits that they had at the time so the original pong ones had a, a baking tray at the back uh, <laughs> and that was where the coins would kind of land and milk carton yeah yeah and stuff like that and i i think this this looks really interesting i remember seeing like all these old kind of home pong units that came out they were kind of the first home consoles weren't they those like really yeah. early machines i remember seeing footage of a a British TV show, and they were like, "Oh, look, you can play tennis at home." And they were like, "One love, two love," <laughs> you know. And it was a, it was a a really kind of interesting time. And I'm sure this got ripped off massively, didn't they? It was a oh, yeah, the grandstand ones and everything, didn't machines, you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But well, this was. I mean, he made this in 1975, so this was is hand carved wood that it's made of, um, and it's got paddle controls in there as well. It's got a start game button. It's got a metal grill for the built-in speaker in there too. And there's actually the finished uh, Pong chip on the prototype circuit board that's in there as well. It was only one of two prototypes that were made by Atari. But he said the reason they made this, it was kind of in the development process when they were kind of figuring out kind of how to make it work in the home. It looks very like that. Like there's this unit on the top with the kind of, knobs and the grill and everything and then it's attached to this giant base unit now i don't know if that base unit actually contains any motherboards or anything in there and it's got these two handles at the side so it looks like it, maybe it's portable but you need two people to carry it but um is it, i think that might just be a table they've put it on for the picture <laughs> yeah maybe <laughs> and uh yeah it, it, it just does look really interesting and really kind of homemade and that's a, a real piece of history there so hopefully it's going to end up somewhere where people can actually see it and enjoy it, not kind of hidden away in some, uh, you know, collector's private collection in his basement or something forevermore. It's always sad when that happens. So, uh, yeah, it would be interesting to see where that ends up. So, I mean, you know, that is kind of like, like you said, Ravi, you know, the first real successful home console, wasn't it? It's kind of, it all came out of that. Yeah, yeah. Everything I think, I think they, they were in pubs. They were, they were all over the place. Those are tiny machines from what I've heard. Yeah, so definitely a piece of history. So uh, if you want to have a look at that picture and read more about it, I'll put that in our show notes at theretrohour.com. And what about this then? This is um, Chrono Cross, the Radical Dreamers edition. Um, this is a remaster of Chrono Cross. It's apparently due out any day now. Actually, should be out the time recording this. Yeah, so this came out on April 7th. So maybe we should have yeah. covered it last week, but I only I only saw it uh, when I was doing the news for this show. Um, so this is the sequel to Chrono Trigger, yeah. the very famous RPG for the Super Nintendo, um, and Chrono Cross, which I don't feel like many people talk about. I mean, I mean if you're a YouTuber, there's probably going to be thousands of people reviewing it and stuff like that, but I just don't seem to see the same kind of love of Chrono, Chrono Trigger gets. But Chrono Cross came out on the PS1 in 1999, I believe it came out, Um and it never came out in the UK. We never got it in Europe. It only came out in Japan and North America. So this is going to be the first time that we're getting a version of it in the UK. But obviously this is a worldwide release on April 7th for the Switch, the PS4, and the Xbox Series X. And obviously it's going to be compatible with PS5 and uh, Xbox One. You know what I mean? The other way around there. Um, yeah. But yeah, this it's a Square Enix game. So about the same people who do you know all the Final Fantasy games and stuff like that. Um, and it's kind of coming off the back of a lot of the early Final Fantasy games have actually recently had pixel remasters for PC and mobile. Um, and a lot of people have been crying out for them to be ported, you know, to Xbox and the PlayStation and Switch, and they haven't. And then off the back of it, they've now done this Chrono Cross um, remaster. Um, but a lot of people are happy because of, one, you couldn't get it in Europe, and two, the Chrono Trigger series hasn't had any love you know, since Chrono Cross came out in 1999. So it's, you know, it's been 23 years since we've had one of these games. But it's a really, from what I understand, it's a massive, massive RPG. Um, I know you you guys aren't huge RPG fans, uh, but... Looking, like, looking at this, like, I, I was really into Final Fantasy VII. And, okay. Like, look, 
looking at this, it looks like something I'd want to play. Yeah. And, and it, the it, idea it, of the different screens and the kind of, it's, it's got a nice vibe to it. You know? Yeah, it, it, it has got that real Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VIII look and feel to it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's Square Enix. It's the same, the same people, you know, who made those games. But there's 40 playable characters in this game that you can have in, you know, to make your party from, um, you know, like Final Fantasy VII, there's like seven or eight characters in yeah. that one. So that just kind of shows you the scope of how big this game is. And, and, and how much, good uh, replayability there. Yeah, how much replayability it has. Um, but it's, they've done what Square Enix have done with all their kind of recent remasters. You know, they've turned off the random enemy encounters. So if you want to turn it off, you can. If you want to skip fights, you can just skip through them and stuff like that. If you just want to play it for the story. There's a new enhanced soundtrack, which there seems to be a little bit of fuss about because these games famously have really good, you know, kind of like orchestral soundtracks and stuff like that. So it'd be interesting to see what they've done with that. Um, and then also it comes with a text-based adventure um, via satellite view which is also included i'm not too sure what that means but i'm just happy that we're seeing some love um and i found out about this game about five or six years ago and i was like oh how can i buy this how can i play it on ps1 on ebay you know and i couldn't it's, get a hold of it <laughs> well so. apparently uh sat satel view was a, a modem that was uh, for the Super Fanny- Famicom. Oh, is it that? Uh, we've talked about that before. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's oh. like based on that, or they oh, might okay. have had a text adventure part of it. And then yeah, I, 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 know, I know what that is. Um, I feel stupid now, because that was like how you played like the other versions of yeah. the Zelda games. It's quite games crazy. You download like yeah. games, magazines uh, through satellite broadcasts. It's so, yeah. just mad. Yeah, so maybe one got done for Chrono Cross, and they're now doing like a text text version of it for for people who buy who buy this game that comes included with it by the sounds of things but yeah um i'm i'm glad it's getting some love but it is funny that i'm seeing all these youtubers and comments saying well what about the pixel remasters of final fantasy that came out on on mobile where are they can you not put them on the switch for us so you know <laughs> give us chance yeah give them a chance maybe <laughs> so uh, but interestingly this actually leaked uh in february as part of the nintendo direct apparently apparently it wasn't meant to be announced but it was <laughs> so i'm not too sure right, okay. how that happened because obviously it's coming out on on xbox and playstation as well so i'm sure i'll pick it up uh for probably for xbox just to get my achievements you know what it, it is interesting because chrono trigger i know has kind of been remastered and re-released loads of times over the years. That was originally a Super Nintendo game, mm. wasn't it? And it's been out on PlayStation, it's been out on Nintendo DS, it's on iOS, Android, Windows versions of it as well. So it's quite interesting to see that the sequel didn't hasn't had as much love until now, but they're finally giving it the respect it deserves. Yeah, you know, and and that's what I said, you know, Chrono Trigger is such a famous RPG and, you know, mm. famously that I don't think that came out in, in Power Regions either. Um uh, it, but they didn't back then a lot of the time. Did no, they? They, it always felt like RPG games were really that kind of Japanese audience really were more into them than we were over here at that in that era in the nineties. Yeah, no, you, 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 maybe Final Fantasy changed that. Yeah, I, I think I think you're spot on there. But like this came after Final Fantasy VII, which was yeah. kind of like the turning point. So you know, but interestingly, up until recently, maybe this didn't sell too well. You could actually go on the official Square Enix website. And you could still buy this brand new for PS1. Oh, wow. Off their website, off their official website for like $20. So perhaps it didn't sell too well, or perhaps they just really overestimated it and made like 10 million copies of it, <laughs> thinking it was going to be the next, you know, big hit like Final Fantasy VII. But yeah, looking forward to this one. Yeah, definitely. So it should be available now by the time the show comes out, obviously on uh, on, on your game stores and your Switch and uh, Xbox as well. So um, definitely something that, you know, if you're a fan of Chrono Trigger, it's always nice to see how the uh, the sequels went to games that we loved back in the day. So definitely worth a look in. Now, of course, we do have uh, a little patron that supports this podcast. If you enjoy what we do each and every Friday, we just want to say a big thanks to our patrons, who are the people that just allow us to do it every week. Because I mean, when we first started this show, we didn't mind paying out of our own pocket to put the show out every week. But it's nice if we don't have to pay for it ourselves, it's, you know, get a bit of help with the running costs. It's quite a hard work, isn't it? Like, you know, yeah. getting guests and doing the research and stuff. So all this really helps. And, you know, we haven't got any backing or any huge company behind us. It's just like three of us kind of producing this for the love and the passion. And it's amazing to have, you know, you guys supporting us and kind of joining us as a community as well. So we we do these like patron chats and hangouts and, Oh my God, they're absolutely amazing. 
Yeah, we've got another one of those coming up very soon. Ravi's going to be jumping on from uh, from his travels in America, so it'll be interesting to see where you are when you join us for the Patrons Hangout uh, a bit later on this month, Ravi. Um, and of course, all patrons get invited to that once a month. We do it on a Sunday night. We all just hang out, have a bit of a giggle, you know, just show off each other's collections and that kind of thing too. And also, uh, patrons get the normal podcast early most weeks. You know, you get extra content in there as well. We actually do a few more news stories just for our patrons. And we actually do a patrons exclusive podcast every month called the Retro Hour after hours. So if you'd like to get involved in any of that, all the details are on our website. And of course, we're backing the show and helping us to bring it out every week. So, I mean, it still blows my mind that we've been doing this podcast for like, what, nearly six and a half years now, which obviously without our patrons, I don't think we'd have made it, it past. It, like, it, it feels video. pretty amazing that we're still doing it. And it feels like we just started it the other day. And I, I, I came in the studio and Dan kind of led us through and we were really dry. Welcome to the retro hour. And Joe was shaking and <laughs> I still <yeah>. am. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we couldn't have made it this far without the, the support of our patrons. So we hugely, hugely appreciate um, any help we can get there. And of course, you will get a mention and a big thank you on the show in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming. Give us a jingle, Ravi. The Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Sorry, that's so bad. <laughs> a big thank you this week to uh, Dave Nietzelt. Kenneth Adams. Charles Smith Jr. Simon Pilgrim. And David Weller. Who all backed us on Patreon, all renewed in the last couple of weeks. We hugely, hugely appreciate your support. Thank you so much. And if you'd like to join them, all the details are at theretrohour.com. And hopefully we'll see you on this month's Hangout. Now, this is something that's been rumoured for a while, and it turns out this rumour is true. Are you excited about this one, Joe? Bloodborne Cart is coming uh, when it's ready, when it's ready. to the PlayStation 1. <laughs> <laughs> so, do, do you guys enjoy Bloodborne? Are you a fan of the Souls games, the Dark Souls I, games? I, I, I've seen them, but I'm not really into them, but this intrigues me <laughs> it's yeah. absolutely insane yeah so as many people probably know bloodborne is the ps4 game part of the the from software kind of soul series or kind of a side to the soul series and it, they're, they're a series of games i absolutely love dark souls one's probably one of my favorite games of all time and i absolutely and they always get reviewed really well yeah exactly and, really and well notoriously hard games i'm currently playing through elden ring i've only just started it though um, a little bit late to the game on that one, but that, that, that's dad life for you. But yeah, about a year ago, um, or maybe about two years ago, uh, there was a Bloodborne D-make floating around on the internet for, P- for PS1. You know, one of these like playable demos where, you know, there's like one fight kind of thing. And um, the people who made it on April 1st, 2021, so la- last year, did a, a demo of Bloodborne Kart, you know, of you know, including like Mario Kart esque music, using the assets of the PS1 D make of Bloodborne to drive around a track, and it looks, you know, obviously it's PS1 version of it, but it does look just like Bloodborne, like you know, and you're playing as like kind of my the main. I mean, you can make your own character, but the kind of main character from all the the media for the game and stuff are driving around in these little yellow carts. Considering this game is set in like a Victorian kind of setting, it's quite <laughs> funny that you can drive around in your little yellow go. And, and they're like still full size sprites as well. <laughs> they're sat in yeah. these like little carts. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it reminds me of like how House of the Dead would look, or. Or yeah, something like that. If you yeah. had a cart game of that, yeah, you know, you, you're spot on there. So, um, you know, they said April 2021. Today's Bloodborne PSX is announcement that the project is now cancelled and we're making Bloodborne Cart instead. Check it out. Obviously, it was an April Fools, but then this year, just before April 1st, so you know, this isn't breaking news. It's about two weeks old. Apologies. Um, <laughs> they said, well, why not make it? Why, why, why not make a, you know, I was going to say Atari cart then. Why not make Bloodborne cart? You know, it's it's real. And as Dan said, it's coming when it's ready. Um, so I'm sure we'll cover it again when it's out and maybe have a couple of games of it. But it looks pretty good quality. Like it looks like from the, compared to the trailer, the fake trailer they put out last year, they've really neatened it up. It's still got that PS1 look to it, but it just looks a lot, cleaner you know and, and not as as pixelated and jagged um but i really like i don't know if you spotted it ravi the akira tribute in the trailer <laughs> yeah 
where, where he's on the big motorbike yeah where he's walking, yeah. Up, walking up to the big motorbike so you know maybe it's not just going to be the yellow carts it's going to be a well, nice well, victorian a, a looking akira was uh notoriously bad so maybe they could yeah. reskin it but um <laughs> yeah I, I was impressed with this like even the demo that they released before like just the, the rate that the textures were running on it and stuff mm. i'm not the lighting looked great yeah yeah, yeah. It, it, look, it looks smart. So, you know, and you've even got like your little health bar and your stamina bar on there like you do in the main game. Um, so what would the weapons be, Joe? Like, well, this is the thing that it points out on a Nintendo Life that it does point out that unlike, you know, Mario Kart, there isn't any weapons uh, in mm. these demos. So hopefully the final game does get them. But in um, the actual Bloodborne, you, you, you use like a sword you know, like a sword or an axe or whatever as your kind of like your main weapon. But then as your kind of parry weapon, you can use like a Victorian gun. So like a cannon or a, a musket. <laughs> nice. um, so it, it'll be interesting to see um, if they do that, you know, with the carts as well. Like, you know, you can pick up muskets and, you know, rifles and stuff like that, you know, from, from that kind of era. That would be, that'd be pretty interesting. To imagine playing Mario Kart, but like burying an axe in the back of someone else's head or firing a cannon at them. That's that, 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 actually, that, isn't it? that completely sums it up. So, you know, yeah. hopefully we'll get this. I'm sure we probably won't get a physical release on the PlayStation 1. But, you know, if we can get it on emulation or even just in browser or something like that. when it's I love ready. how niche it is and just weird. Yeah, <laughs> like oh, absolutely. Such an offshoot from the original line. <laughs> Yeah, so it does look loads of fun as well. I love it when, you know, they do this. We've obviously had a few games like this that are kind of spoofs, aren't they? And just kind of entries in a franchise that you just wouldn't expect from the official developers. So it's uh, yeah, it's lots of fun to see, you know, when fans do this kind of thing. So we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye out for that one. Now, being an RPG fan, um, this looks pretty incredible. Now, um, you know, I'll be honest, RPGs are not really my genre, but I know, Joe, you're a big fan of them. This is a game called um, Lycia. The Lost Island. Now, this is what appears to be a Zelda-like open-world adventure game that's coming not only to the Commodore 64, but also um, my first ever computer, the Commodore Plus 4. Now, this has kind of been talked about for a couple of months, and they reckon this is going to be quite a big game. I've got a feeling the saying this is going to be hitting like four full discs. It says it disc um, sides, so could you like kind of swap the discs Yeah, you can over? turn the discs around. Yeah, you can. Yeah, so I guess two floppy discs, you know, double-sided. But there is actually a trailer that you can watch, and this is from uh, Protovision, who've obviously done you know quite a lot of Commodore 64 titles. And there's a video on YouTube, um, the trailer of it as well that you can skip through. There's kind of some like you know modern kind of graphics in there as well. But then when you get about a minute or so into it, you see the graphics in the game, and there are um, graphical screenshots of the 64 and the Plus 4 version as well. And it's even got like. Um, cinematic intros in there as well they're saying there's 25 songs in the game too 40 different characters 580 screens in the game too and hours worth of gameplay with 2,000 lines of text in the game too so this looks like an epic game i mean not only for the commodore 64 but doing something like this on the commodore plus 4 and 16 just looks insane it looks massive for the, for the Commodore 64, like you say. And I, I like the anime look it's got to it. Like, I, I use this phrase a lot, you know, people could do it as a drinking game, but it's got a real labour of love look to it again. Um, you know, there seems to be like a real kind of detailed story to it. And they've, you know, in the trailer for it, they've even got like the hand-drawn like anime characters and, and stuff as well. Like, you know, in the intro and in the artwork and stuff like that. So it does look pretty massive. Like, you know, considering it, like you say, it's for the Commodore 64. So do you think you'll be playing it, Dan? Do you think you'll be a, an RPG uh, fan after this one? I am very intrigued by it. Um, and there is actually, I've just been looking at their page, there is a preview version of it that you can download to play on your original hardware on the 64 uh, and the plus four as well. And I've actually got my Commodore plus four set up right next to me at the moment. Um, my original machine, you know, my first ever computer that I got when I was six years old, when I was a kid, still got it set up actually in my um, office at the moment. I packed my 64 away a while ago and set the plus four up again, just to play some old games. So timing on this is pretty good. Actually it only came out on March 31st. Haven't had a chance to play it yet, but there is actually um, a D64 image you can download. It needs 64 K of Ram which um, I just think is insane they've managed to fit all that into 64 kilobytes. But also, if you haven't got a Plus 4 or a 64 set up, you can actually play it online in your browser on an emulator. So, you know, if you just want to get a feel for what the game's like. And 
it's got a really interesting kind of, you know, it's that kind of typical story, you know, the, the 80s and 90s RPG games. It starts on Nora, her 16th birthday. Everything's like it always has been. She has to unwrap her birthday presents, but then her mum's got a few little chores for her to do around the village. Nothing too stressful until obviously she goes on a bit of a quest. So it kind of sounds like, you know, a, a typical kind of childhood adventure story. Um, and I think graphically, I mean, I've played a few of the original Zelda games a bit, but I, they were never really my genre. But graphically, it looks quite similar, I think. Yeah, it it, it reminds me more of... It's reminding me of a game called Lufia for the Super Nintendo, even right. though its graphics aren't as good as that. But it has definitely got that kind of like Zelda look to it. But I was going to say Zelda doesn't have as much text, but it does. So I don't know what I'm smoking. Mm. It, it does. It does have a <laughs> Zelda look to it as well. It does. But it, to me, it looks more like like maybe like Illusion of Gaia or like Lufia or Terra Enigma. But they they were all Super Nintendo games. So whereas this obviously has that eight bit style to it, but it it does. It does look nice. It's captivating me. I'm like looking at it, you know. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a retro computer guy, you know. As you guys know, I'm, I'm a, a console guy. But when you said that I could play it in my browser, I'm like, oh, okay, I could, could play this rather than working. <laughs> and it looks, it looks really good as well. Like they've, they've added loads of stuff like the uh, Proto Pad as well, which is that uh, pad that we covered ages ago from ProtoVision as well. Uh, that's supported, and they've got a. Uh, SD to IEC version as well. So, uh, yeah, definitely worth a download if you're a fan of RPGs or you just want something good to play on your, your 64 or your Commodore Plus 4 if you've got one. I'll put a link to uh, both those downloads in our website at theretrohour.com and in the show notes as well. Now, before we chat to this week's special guest, Steve Weatherall, coming up in just a moment, let's take a quick second to give a big thank you to this week's sponsor, our amazing friends at Future Publishing. Now, of course, Future Publishing bring you the best video games magazines, whether that be the retro stuff that we talk about or current gen gaming as well. And we have got an incredible offer where you can subscribe and save up to 95% off the price of these magazines and get three issues for just one pound. Now, this is an exclusive offer only for you lucky people, listeners of the Retro Hour podcast, and this includes all of Future's gaming magazines. Now, of course, we're going to talk about Retro Gamer, which, you know, is one of our favourite magazines, but also they do loads of others as well, including, you know, if you're into your really credible gaming journalism, Edge magazine that has been going for years and years now. And still, I think, is, you know, if you want that really in depth analysis about video games, that is a magazine that you need to be reading each month. And they cover loads of different games in this month's issue. Yeah, man, they're covering a game that I'm actually loving at the moment, Elden Ring. Um, They've got a really, really, really in-depth Let's Play about that, which is really awesome. They're also covering, you know, brand new games like Gran Turismo 7. Another one I'm excited about, Total War, Warhammer 3 looks really, really cool. Um, So if you really want like that kind of highbrow, really detailed kind of reviews of these games, Edge is where you need to be. Yeah, and also PC Gamer magazine this month. I've just seen the cover of uh, this month's issue of PC Gamer. I imagine you went into meltdown when you saw that. Joe. Yeah, <laughs> I'm really excited about this one. They've got the inside scoop on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge, oh, um, wow. which I'm really excited about. There's, it's gone a little bit quiet, that game has. So they've actually got a uh, inside discussion with the developers of that game, which I'm really excited about reading as well. And of course, their Play Magazine, if you're a PlayStation fan, uh, covering the PSVR 2 that all PlayStation fans are really hyped for at the moment. A bit about GTA 6 as well, that's got to be one of the most anticipated games of all time. And of course, they bring you the wonderful Retro Gamer Magazine. Actually, I've got this month's issue of Retro Gamer hot off the press in my hand right now. And uh, they are celebrating 40 years of the ZX Spectrum. Actually, I've just realised celebrates its 40th anniversary this year, which is crazy. I bet that makes you feel old, doesn't it? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the things we talk about on this show do, to be honest. Uh, but this one actually gives you a year-by-year account of Sir Clive Sinclair's spectacular 8-bit home computer. So uh, the main feature is 40 years of the spectrum. There's also the evolution of Echo the Dolphin in here as well, the making of the Terminator. There's also um, a really interesting feature about Kung Fu Master that was mm. one of my favourite fighting games back in the day. I think the first ever video game I played. Yeah, Kung I think Fu that's Master. regarded as one of the first ever beat them ups as well and another one i'm excited about in there is the making of the simpsons hit and run they actually get the original developers on there and discussing about that which has been a lot of hype about that game recently 
Yeah, hilarious game that as well, isn't it? So yeah. um, if you're a fan of it, all retro stuff that we talk about, you're going to love Retro Gamer magazine. So uh, have a look at this right now. Check out our exclusive link and you can get three issues of your favourite future gaming mag for just one pound. You know, people tweet us and go, seriously, just one pound? This is an amazing offer, but don't miss out on it because we also get a lot of people who, you know, tweet in six months' time going, is that still on? Do this right now. Head to our link, magazinesdirect.com slash retro hour, and that's a saving of up to 95% off the cover price of Retro Gamer, Edge, Play, or PC Gamer UK by heading to our website, magazinesdirect.com slash retro hour. I'll put that in the show notes as well. And a big thank you to our friends at Future Publishing for their support of our show. Now, next, we are going to be talking about all kinds of stuff with our amazing guest this week. Pretty much, you know, going through the uh, the Amstrad, Manic Miner to Command and Conqueror, Desert Strike. Loads of stuff in this interview is packed. We are joined by the amazing Steve Weatherall next on the Retro Owl podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it is time for our favourite bit of the show when we welcome on a special guest. And of course, we're going to be chatting about so many incredible games. I mean, pretty much this week, Manic Miner to uh, the CNC series. So, uh, you know, quite a wide range of games to cover with our special guest this week, the wonderful Steve Weatherill. How are you doing, Steve? Dan, I'm doing very good. How are you doing? Very good, thanks. And uh, we really appreciate you taking a bit of time to uh, come onto our podcast and have a bit of a chat about your history in the industry. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Absolutely. Well, let's wind it all the way back. You know, this might be quite interesting just to kind of find out where it all started for you. I mean, do you remember, you know, your first ever video games experience when you first discovered them? Yeah, a couple of things uh, come to mind when I think about that. I remember probably in the late 1970s, um, my family borrowed this really primitive TV game device. I think it was a uh, Binatone, and it had uh, you know various flavors of Pong and mm. multiple controllers. So I remember we had that for a few weeks. You know, nothing. I think we gave it back after a couple of weeks, so nothing much came of that. But more formative uh, recollection, I guess. I remember a the particular uh, video game arcade in Barnsley right across from the library. So when I was at school, again, this would be the late 70s, every Wednesday morning, we'd catch the bus from school to Barnsley Town Centre to go to the tech. And uh, I was doing an electrical engineering class. When the class finished, we basically had lunchtime in town to do what we wanted to do for an hour. And invariably, you know, we would go to that arcade. I remember Space Invaders was definitely present. I think Asteroids was there. Or well, maybe that was a little bit later. I'm not sure. I do remember not having many uh, Tempe pieces to spend, so I suspect I did more watching than playing. But that's one of the early uh, recollections on video games. That was the thing you did if you didn't have money in the arcade. You just looked over another kid's shoulder and enjoyed the experience, I remember. Yeah, and they were usually better than me anyway. So, And uh, what systems did you have when you were kind of growing up at home? Like, Did you have a, a system that really captured you and that you uh, started getting programming on? Yeah, it's a good Question. I don't think I ever had a system when I was growing up, you know, in quotes. I do remember a friend of mine, Richard Barwell. He had a uh, Science of Cambridge Mark 14 kit, and I helped solder that together. And I do remember typing in programs in hex. I think Science of Cambridge was the precursor to Sinclair Research. It was a client's company, and it was like a hex pad uh, single board computer with a seven segment LED display. And you could enter programs on this hex pad by, you know, typing in the hex code and clicking next. And obviously with a, uh, like a calculator display, the games you could do on that were pretty primitive. I remember like a duck, like a duck shoot game. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't, um, didn't have one at home, didn't have a computer at home. I do remember in my last year in uh, secondary school, I mentioned before I was doing this electrical engineering class once a week. Well, yeah. In the last year of school, they said, hey, you can, there's now a new option you guys can do. So the choices were motor mechanics, I think, or mechanical engineering. I'm not sure what they called it. Electrical engineering. And the new thing was computer class. But there was a, there was a sort of caveat to that. You had to be in the top math group because, you know, you were sort of segmented into groups. And there had to be at least three people. And there were exactly two of us signed up for this class. It was myself and Alan Dolby. And so because there weren't three people, we couldn't do the class, basically. So uh, for a year, oh, wow. this thing, I think it was a research machines 
380Z, you know, 380Z, as you would say. And it sat into this in this room, all mysterious, and it was off limits. So, so yay. <laughs> We were just looking at it through the window, we were, longingly. We would see it when we walked past and the door was open for some reason, but we were not allowed in there. Well, how did you get involved in kind of making your own kind of software projects then? So let's see. So I went to Manchester University. I was doing electrical engineering. And after the second year, I dropped out, basically. You know, so I, was, I wasn't, uh, didn't have gainful employment for a while. So during that period, thanks to my mom, she, she actually bought me a 16K Spectrum along with a small black and white TV. And I was sort of mainly interested in electronics. And I was planning to make a keyboard synthesizer with a Spectrum interface. Um, but, it, you know, inevitably, I sort of got sidetracked by games and trying to figure out how the heck they were made. You know, I, I did actually do uh, Z80 or Z80 in, in college. But the kind of stuff we were doing was like traffic light controller, you know, kind of simple mm-hmm. stuff. Nothing, anything like a game. So I was very curious, you know, like how do you go from such simple programs to something that's interactive and real time and all that? So yeah, I started hacking away into the wee small hours, night after night, trying to figure out how these games were made, making my own demos. And then eventually that turned into me sending out demos to various publishers. I think uh, the main thing I sent out was like a sideways scrolling platform game prototype. And, you know, Software Projects Company was one of the publishers I sent it to. And uh, the rest is literally history. I ended up starting work at Software Projects. So I know you, um, obviously, Manic Miner was a massive hit on the Spectrum. How did you get involved with that? Because didn't you do the Amstrad version of that game then? Yeah, it was a huge hit. I, it was one of the games that um, was, you know, was one of the ones that distracted me from my electronics pursuits. So like, how the heck did they make Manic Miner? So I think that came out in 1983. I think Jets at Willie had come out in 84. And that's right around the time. I think it was just at the time that I was sending out this demo. So I ended up talking to software projects right after Jets at Willie had published on the Spectrum. And so when I started there, it did take them a little while to figure out what they wanted to do with this. You know, like there was me and a couple of other guys started at the same time. And... Um, in the end, though, we uh, ended up starting working on the Amstrad ports of those games when the Amstrad came out. Well, like it was a massive hit. Minor Willie kind of became a, a British icon at the time, and uh, Matthew yeah. Smith was, you know, um, originally developing that. Like, w- did you have much of a relationship with him? Did you talk to him at all? And uh, what was it like when that whole thing kind of blew up? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't super close to Matthew. He did come into the office from time to time, but for the most part, he was working from home. So I think, honestly, I probably hung out with him more socially than in work, funnily enough. And um, I do remember I was present for the uh, somewhat infamous toga incident at Stairways Rock Club in Birkenhead where Matthew showed up in a toga. So we would definitely hang out outside of work. Matthew um, also, towards the end of my time, I think, at Software Projects, him and Mark Wilding and Stu Fotheringham were teamed up to build this Mega Tree game, which was supposed to be, uh, you know, Matthew's next thing. So those guys were actually working out of the house that was owned by a software project that I was living in. So I would sort of pass them in the mornings when I left to commute to, to the office because so I was working out of the software project's office, and then I would see them in the evenings when I got back. Um, I don't. Actually, I think too much was uh, done on that game. Obviously, Megatree didn't come out. But it might be sort of, uh, sort of a telling insight as to how closely you know, we worked with Matthew. Because um, we, at no time did Derek Rosen, who was the guy that I worked with on both Manic Miner and Jets at Willy, uh, at no time did we ever see the original source code to either of those games. So we basically... Even though we were employed by the company and working in the office, the source code to those games was not provided. So it's kind of an interesting situation. I, I don't. It's kind of hard to explain in retrospect. <laughs> you know, it's like why so wouldn't they give you the source code? Reverse engineering it essentially, or kind of building it from scratch. Yeah, of, yeah, know. we did. I mean, Derek actually, who's a really smart guy, he had made a disassembler. It's a really small. Uh, relocatable disassembler that could live anywhere in memory. 
and so we basically disassembled Manic Miner and tried to figure out how things were working and did the same thing for Jetset Willy. So and I remember back then when um, a lot of Amstrad owners, you know, would pretty much get straight, you know, Spectrum ports without much enhancements. I mean, did yeah. you did you take advantage more of the, the Amstrad hardware in any way? I think with Manic Miner, it was pretty much a straight port. Um, we used, you know, a particular screen mode on the Amstrad that actually is higher resolution than the Spectrum, but has a lower number of colors. And so it was pretty much the best, you know, it, it was like an accurate representation of the game. I think, you know, arguably the sound is better because you have something that isn't a beeper. But other than that, it was pretty accurate to the original. I think with uh, when it came time to do Jet Set Wheelie, we just started adding rooms to it, <laughs> you know, and uh, we ended up doubling the number of rooms. And I don't think we were ever given permission to do that. It wasn't like, you know, at, at no point did we sit around the table with the management of software projects and go, hey, you guys, we want to do this, you know, game that we want to sort of double the size of it. It just kind of happened. And I think, from my recollection, I think when the management team and especially the marketing guys cottoned on, they said, hey, we can, you know, we can spin this. And that's why they sort of acquired the Final Frontier name tag that was uh, present on the Amstrad version because mm. we'd sort of almost uh, surreptitiously just kind of chosen a Star Trek theme for some of the extra rooms. In that sense, we, you know, we were able to add more rooms onto the Amstrad compared to the original game. Of course, without the original, that would have been nothing. And essentially, we were like the first modders of that game look like that way well how did you end up uh, owning computer graphics then yeah so when i was at software projects Stu fotheringham was it actually started at the company the same day i did uh, i think he was 16 years old when he started and I, I was a couple of years older than him i think i was 21 and so i did i worked on both the the ports for uh, manic minor and jet set willy Stu at some point had left to go to work at odin and uh mark was at software projects for a while. And he basically, uh, I think when um, it was clear that the Mega Tree game really wasn't going anywhere, both those guy guys left together. And then, you know, one day Stu said to me, uh, hey, uh, Steve, come check out what we're doing over here at Odin. And so I did. I remember going into the office one evening and they had a guy, Dave, I think his name was, working on Nodes of Yazard. He was uh, a programmer working on the game. And he'd done some initial stuff. And I remember going in and seeing the somersault animation of that main character, Astro Charlie, you know, on the blue moon surface. And um, they, they said, hey, we're looking to build and expand the team and have more people join. And it sounded pretty interesting to me. I felt like, you know, I was at a good stopping point, having finished both of the two ports at Software Projects. And so, uh, you know, I went over and, and joined them at Odin. Well, Fiber Telecomsoft, they were like a legendary company as well at the time. How did you end up getting involved with those guys? I was involved with those guys because Odin was involved with them. You know, there was a fairly sort of well-known deal that Telecomsoft did with Odin to produce a certain number of games inside of 12 months. And um, ultimately, sort of a TLDR version of that is that it didn't go well at the end of that. And there was a, certainly a difference of opinion as to whether, you know, Odin had met the terms of that particular agreement. And um, through the circumstances there, Odin ended up closing down and went out of business. So I already had a connection to some of the people there at Firebird. And, um, you know, Tony Beckwith had been the producer uh, for Firebird right at the end of that period. And so when Odin closed, you know, I was sort of trying to figure out what the next step would be. And we talked to Tony and it seemed like a reasonable idea to make what is essentially a, a sequel to one of the Odin games and, and do that directly for Firebird. That, that was the uh, crosswise game. And I worked on that with Colin, Colin Grunes, who was, you know, one of the key artists at Odin, did all of the animation for Nodes of Yazard and so on. And I know you ended up at um, Denton Designs as well, and they were, you know, a really interesting company. Um, 
based in Liverpool. Yep. And uh, you know, we had Ed John Gibson on the show talking about how that, you know, obviously there was the, the unfinished mega games, you know, Bandersnatch from Imagine and a lot of kind of the Imagine software DNA went into there. How did you get involved with them and what was kind of the atmosphere like at the time when you joined there? Yeah, I mean, they were another Liverpool company. After um, working on Crosswise, I was looking for the next thing. I would say uh, Denton's is a very well-known company. They're, they're small but prolific, right? They're, they have their name on a lot of well-known games. And we knew, we knew them socially pretty well as well because they were in the same city. And so it, it seemed like a good opportunity to go and work on 16-bit. So I initially started there with the, the sort of task of building a game on the Atari ST. And um, so, so that was the goal. It's not sort of uh, the proudest time of my career because I think through the combination of uh, financial stress with Odin closing and a number of other factors, I never completed a game at Denton Designs. Did start a couple of interesting games, but unfortunately didn't really get anywhere with them. The one game that did ship from that period is a game called Fox Fights Back. And uh, I actually left the company before that shipped and John Heap was one of the principals at Denton's finished that game. I don't usually put that on my bio because I didn't finish it. It does represent probably the pinnacle of what I accomplished on the spectrum because I, you know, we sort of moved on to 16 bit after about 1988, everything was 16 bit with the Amiga and the Atari ST. So yeah, so it was an interesting uh, period at one time at Denton's I was working on three games simultaneously. And uh, I just burned out <laughs> at that company. <laughs> and I didn't know it at the time. But, you know, in retrospect, it's like, yeah, totally. I mean, you can't work that intensely on so many things for so long. It was stressful financially as well because of, you know, some of the circumstances that I mentioned. The one thing I would take away from Denton's, and, you know, I'm still on good terms with those guys, even though it didn't work out from a work point of view. But uh, it did have a chance to expand some of the... Uh, uh, scrolling techniques that I'd sort of been develop, developing on a spectrum to 16-bit machines. And that was useful in some of the games that I did sub subsequently. So it's kind of, uh, you know, it's like a uh, saving grace for that period for me. And uh, some of that tech went into a projectile game that I did subsequently to that. Yeah, because I know you worked with Mark Kyle and the crew at System 3. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously, I mean, th they were really focused on the Amiga at that stage as well. I mean, how did you find that transition from, like, you know, Spectrum to Amiga? That must have felt like <laughs> jumping about 10 generations. I think the Atari ST is basically like the 16-bit Spectrum in that there's not much extra hardware. There's basically a CPU, and then there's a screen buffer and not much more. I mean, it has a sound chip, but... And the, compared to the Amiga, which is really the Commodore 64 of the 16-bit platforms, you know, I like both platforms. I totally, I would always say I prefer developing for the ST because it just suits my style of trying to push the limited hardware as far as I can. I just like the fact that it was basically, you know, like it was a 68,000 chip, a bunch of memory, and a screen buffer that, you know, lives at a certain address in memory. And then what you do with it is down to, you know, how you can sort of take advantage of that very limited hardware. And it, that's that really, um, a lot of the stuff I did on the Spectrum was very much of that, you know, you know that uh, nature and that, that approach, basically trying to squeeze everything out of very limited hardware. And actually, I remember, um, I think the first 16-bit game, that was published that I had published was projectile and we I uh, led development on the Atari ST and we ported that to the Amiga um, you know sort of leading up to the release of the game and, and I know that uh, the game performed better on the Atari ST just because of how I really totally optimized it to work on that hardware and uh, it was more difficult to pull that off on the Amiga even though it had clearly superior, you know, video hardware in there. Well, no, you, you worked on a Myth History in the Making when you were at System 3 as well, which um, I, I love that game. I think I first got it on um, a cover disc on Amiga format, like a demo of it. Love the atmosphere on that game. I mean, have you got any kind of, what are your memories of working on that project then? Yeah, I mean, so right at the, let's say mid to end of 1988, 
I had started my own company with Mark Wilding, uh, Eldritch the Cat. So it was our own game dev studio, which we ran for about four years, I think. Over that period, you know, we worked with a bunch of different publishers. Um, System 3 were one of them. And so, uh, and the Myth game was actually, uh, it's one of the System 3 games that we worked on. We worked on Flimbo's Quest and a bunch of stuff, mostly doing platform ports. Um, though Myth, uh, I think, um, I think uh, Myth took System 3 quite a long time to complete. I think they had a few false starts with that. But we were doing the 16-bit versions of it anyway. I, I believe there were there was a Commodore 64 version. It's a little uh, fuzzy in my memory. So yeah, it's uh, unfortunately <laughs> one of the recollections I do have with that game is that my company Eldritch the Cat we actually closed that down in probably about halfway through development of that version of Myth. And so the guy that was working on it, a guy called Dave Colclough, took basically took the game and finished it as an independent contractor for system three. But, right. but yeah, we did a bunch of stuff for system three around that time. We like, I personally composed music for a bunch of their games and like, we did a lot in that period. <laughs> How did you end up getting involved with EA then? Yeah. So when we closed down our studio, Eldritch the cat, we were actually, we'd done projectile as a, you know, it was an original game design and it was published by Electronic Arts. I personally was working on a new game, uh, a new a new original game for EA. So we decided to close the company. And then I, I think Electronic Arts were quite interested in continuing development of the game, which was called FLOPS, which is uh, it's an acronym for uh, the Free League of Pathetic Superheroes. So it's, it's a game about uh, useless superheroes, basically. I decided not to pursue that particular route and didn't uh, take that game to completion. But I did go and work for Electronic Arts in the Slough. They were in Langley at the time. So I went and uh, moved down to south of England from Liverpool, which is where I'd been based prior, and uh, basically started as the uh, development manager for the internal development that EA were doing. And we did a bunch of stuff. Uh, we did a few ports to the Amiga from the Mega Drive. So we did John Madden Football and Desert Strike on the Amiga. And mm. we kicked off a couple of original titles, but uh, unfortunately none of them uh, went to completion for various reasons. One of them was for the 3DO machine. And at a certain point in time, EA stopped all development for that because it wasn't doing numbers in the market that they needed. So yeah, yeah nobody I, could afford it. Yeah, and it was inexpensive. It was like seven or eight hundred dollars, I think, when it came out. So yeah, we'd known Electronic Arts for a little while, and so it was kind of a logical next step for me to go work with them in some capacity. And the you know the Strike games obviously became a, a really big franchise. And um, what was it kind of like working on Desert Strike? And I remember the Amiga version of that was, you know, very faithful to the Mega Drive version. It even had stuff like um, that you rarely found on the Amiga, like two-button joystick support. If you plugged a Mega Drive pad in, you could actually select the weapons with uh, the C button, I remember. So it was, you know, really pushed the Amiga quite a bit, that game, I thought. Yeah, it's um, the main, uh, the lead engineer on that game was a guy called Gary Roberts, and he was very good. And, you know, we did have, un unlike the uh, software project situation, we did have the source code to the Genesis game. So that was always good to have that as a reference. And, um, yeah, you know, we were able to do uh, the scrolling that we needed to do to match the Genesis. And uh, we added uh, a bunch of stuff to the game. Um, we, we, I think we added some new co-pilots and... Um, there is a funny story around that game, too, which is uh, it, basically the main helicopter. The main helicopter in Desert Strike is sort of a modified Apache AH-64. Mm. It's not actually, but it's very similar to one. So at some point, uh, someone encouraged me to call the Hughes Company in California. We were based in, in Slough. And so I did, and I said, hey, I'm at Electronic Arts. We're doing this game. Can you send us any video material? The photos that we can use for assets in our game. I spoke to someone and I gave them, you know, my address and, and everything. And I think months went by 
and we didn't hear anything. And then suddenly this care package arrived and in it was a, uh, well, there were a couple of videotapes and a whole bunch of photos. And it was basically the marketing materials that the Hughes Corporation would send out to whoever might be interested in buying their helicopters, I guess. Um, <laughs> you know, so, uh, and the video was right. like a TV <laughs> commercial for their helicopter. And it's like, if you want a helicopter that, <laughs> you know, can sneak up on a bunch of tanks. Yeah, it was like a car commercial for the, for a helicopter. So I think we used a couple of those assets in the game. Uh, but it was quite amusing to see the fact that these things even exist. Like, you know, these military <laughs> companies actually have a marketing department that creates ads and things. Well, one game was uh, Dune, which was absolutely amazing game. Uh, yeah. A real pioneer in RTS. And uh, that was um, originally Westwood. But uh, yep. what was kind of virgin's involvement uh originally and how, how did that kind of get into the development of command and conquer um i was wondering like what the relationship between virgin and ea and stuff was like at that time yeah um so dune came out i believe in december 1992 um i started at westwood in february 94 so by the time i came out you know and i moved out to the states um, it, Dune had shipped. They were working on a couple of platform ports. They did the Amiga version and the Genesis version wasn't quite finished when I got, got there. So they were, they were wrapping that. And then Command and Conquer had been in development for a couple of months at that point. So, you know, it, it was still the early days and it was kind of, uh, when I first started there, it was sort of like the secret project. You know, you had to be the inside team to be even to even see any of the development on Command and Conquer. So it was super hush hush. From my recollection, Virgin, you know, Dune had come out, Dune 2 had come out, it was successful. Uh, Westwood was doing something, they're doing this Command and Conquer sequel. I think, um, like, other than a few show and tell kind of meetings, Virgin were pretty hands off, you know, within reason anyway basically just let Westwood get on with it. So, yeah, it wasn't, they certainly were not dictating the design in any way. It was all coming out of, you know, Westwood Studios there in Las Vegas. Well, this was exactly the kind of time period that uh, CD-ROM technology had really reached this point where you had, like, streaming video on there and stuff. And, you know, you'd actually uh, managed to develop it, like earlier consoles, like the 3DO and stuff. It was, it was kind of in its infancy then, was there a real aim at uh, Westwood to kind of get CNC to be a huge CD-ROM title? Yeah, we um, we definitely thought a video cutscenes were, were going to be a key part of the game. And so there was uh, quite a lot of effort and investment in building our own video uh, technology, basically. So we, we developed our own codec. We actually... Uh, consulted with a guy out of MIT, I believe, who had a video compression algorithm called VQ. So we licensed that tech. Because of the sort of relationship of computing power and, you know, the sort of length of time it took to compress these videos, we, we actually built a render farm. So we had a bank of machines and we built uh, we built that out, and then built out technology to basically farm out compression of video frames to this farm of machines. And so, yeah, there was a lot of that happening for Command and Conquer, in in sort of in conjunction with, of course, all of the production that has to happen to uh, a render, you know, the three D uh, cutscenes for you know all of the you know, the aircraft and all of the ground-based vehicles. Obviously, it was all uh, 3D rendered. And then there's a lot of live-action stuff in there, too. Yeah. And sort of combining all of that, you know, filming that stuff, compositing it into the CG stuff, compressing that stuff, being able to fit it on a CD, being able to play it back in real time. Um, yeah, there's quite a lot of effort involved with all of that. Yeah, and it became a key part of the game. You know, and yes, it's it's uh, arguably a very camp kind of style, but I think it, it's set. It's often been copied, or it's the, there have been attempts to copy that style, and it, it's fallen a little flat. Some of the stuff EA did 
tried to do that and it didn't quite come off. So I think we were sort of uh, naively innocent, but sincere with the, how we were doing that stuff. Well, it, it stuck to the same kind of structures of like, you know, Dune and Desert Strike and stuff where you had the briefings yep. and and then you had, you know, the pumping music and uh, playing and it worked really well with just all those different elements and it created that kind of multimedia experience where other people have been really trying with like huge FMV games and stuff. Uh, the, the kind of simplicity and the, the gameplay of it worked really well. Yeah, I think it, it, was, a ni- it was nice, I think, uh, also f- just from a pacing point of view to have a a bit of a respite, you know, between between levels, which could be quite intense when you were playing through the campaigns. Yeah, so I think it I think it worked out pretty well. Yeah, there was that kind of thing that you'd do a mission and you complete it, and you would have built your base, and then you needed that kind of you know you put a lot of work in, and then you needed that kind of bridge to move you into the next. Right, I'm in a a new situation. Right, sure. In a way, it's like your reward for completing the level. It's like, what's the next cutscene going to be? <clears throat> you know, how does it move the story along? Yeah, totally. And um, like, there was different abilities to play as well. So you had, you know, selecting each side. It wasn't just one side versus an enemy, and also uh, multiplayer as well. Um, did you guys spend much time like playing land games together in the studio? Oh my god, yeah! Every single night. I remember the very first game we had. And the only unit you could you could build was the rocket launcher guy, the rocket guy. And so, of course, you know we would be playing four player games where there are four guys each with fifty rocket guys. So it kind of started there. And we were like, oh my god, <laughs> what the potential of this thing is amazing. Being, I think, being able to it, it was kind of a double edged sword. Being able to play all of these units in multiplayer was great because you could balance the abilities by having a range of different people play them and get an idea for, you know, the relative sort of attack damage and defensive, you know, sort of statistics that they have. Uh, and that was definitely part of the balancing. It is a double-edged sword, though, because you also have to balance the single-player campaigns. And, you know, generally speaking, in those ga- in, certainly in those days, less so today, obviously, but back then the AI was... Pretty, uh, pretty much scripted, you know, you would have triggers and then you would have basic behaviors. So, you know, get in range of unit, it will fire at you kind of thing. Maybe it will follow you. And, you know, the en- the AI or the enemy attacks would basically follow along the same sort of thing where they were scripted. You know, it's like the enemy would build a bunch of units and then send them to your base, basically, and try and take out key buildings. And that's not really how a human plays at all. And so I think it was quite a difficult task for the game designers. And by the way, I don't take any credit for any of the design balance in the game. And that was totally the design department and other people doing that. But yeah, I think it was a double-edged sword because, yes, you can balance the units out for pure stats, but how you use the units is very different to how they appear to you when you're playing through a campaign. So it's quite challenging, I think. If you were playing previous strategy games like uh, Warcraft, you know, there would be um, resources like gold and wood and stuff, traditional ones. Where did mm-hmm. the kind of idea of Tiberian come and this uh, mega resource that everybody really wanted and were willing to fight over? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's a direct analogy for Spice that was in Dune. And, you know, we couldn't do Spice. So we came up with this thing called Tiberium. And there is a uh, there's a whole background law behind it that is you know different and unique to Command and Conquer, but certainly you know it it certainly has its origins in that uh, spice resource and spice obviously is like a major part of the the whole Dune novels and movies and so on. Obviously, I mean Red Alert ended up becoming you know more popular than C and C, and it formed its own sub series. I mean, where did that kind of idea come from? Yeah, it was um, I believe. And, you know, it's a while ago, so it's kind of hard to recall exactly and the, the exact chronology. But I believe the idea initially was to make a uh, mission disc for Command & Conquer that was sort of back in time. And the working title for that was CNC Zero. So it was like a prequel, basically. And the initial thought was that that would just be an add-on mission disc. 
And I think what happened was, as the ideas for that evolved and as the gameplay started to evolve, it became clear that it stands on its own. You know, it certainly didn't need to, it, it didn't really need to lean on the Command and Conquer side of things in order to, to succeed as a game. You know, it stood alone. And, and so at a certain point in development, the decision was made to make it a full-fledged first-class season and publish it as a standalone product. And I think it was the right decision too. It was, um, I think, you know, basically, with a couple of exceptions, basically, uh, Red Alert is the Command & Conquer game engine with a year of, uh, you know, development and balancing and so I think probably or possibly people, you know, might perceive that or, you know, when they play the game, they, they, they feel like it's a more balanced game. And that's because it basically had more time. Um, it took about, it was pretty quick development. It was about uh, a year. I think it came out almost a year to the day after Command & Conquer. But, you know, it had a really good starting point, obviously, with Command & Conquer. And it just kind of built on that for a year and benefited from a, a year of additional balance and a year of observing how um, actual players play Command & Conquer out in the wild that may or may not be what you sort of thought they would do. Two big changes, I think, that uh, on the tech side that were part of Red Alert were, uh, first of all, the internet multiplayer stuff was in there, uh, which Command & Conquer was LAN only. Uh, it was only two-player head-to-head in Red Alert, but at least it was in there. And then the other thing was there was the sort of Windows 95 version of the game that ran in a higher resolution. And so you got both a DOS version and a Windows uh, 95 version on the same disk. And I think that also helped from uh, like a sales and marketing point of view because different regions in the world have a different sort of, you know, level of install base. Like wh where's the tech at? And I know that in Europe... Uh, in Germany, for example, it's a huge market. I think it's more than half of the total sales for those Command & Conquer games were in Germany. But their machine specs in Germany were a little lower than the US, just the average machine spec. So having a you know a DOS version of the game worked really well in those markets. And then the, the folks that had a higher spec could play the higher res version of the game. And so, yeah, I think a lot of things came together nicely for, for, for Red Alert and um, really sort of built on what was done with Command & Conquer. I, I think that idea of having um, some kind of real influence in there with, like, Soviet um, side yeah. uh, compared to, you know, uh, the first one where it was, like, more like Dune with, you know, fanatical factions in there. but Sci-fi, right? Yeah, yeah, but twisting that uh, alternative history with stuff like the uh, Tesla and, um, you know, kind of... a uh, it, it, that that kind of camping it up again and turning it into a bit of a comical kind of uh, exactly uh, way. Do you think that really changed it and made it a lot more popular? That kind of appeal and people being able to relate to, you know, a bit of history but alternative. Yeah, and it's interesting too how that sort of uh, evolved from there, and you know, like Kane would show would show up in some of the Red Alert stuff, and it's like, what's that about then? So it gave us uh, some interesting things to play with too, I think, from a story point of view. Well, obviously, Kane kind of became the face of CNC. Yeah. What, what did you think of that then? And obviously, it was a, you know, he kind of became the main thing that people knew the game for. Yeah, I mean, Joe Kukin, who played Kane, is um, you know he he worked at Westwood. He was the sort of uh, he he directed basically all of the. About 100% of the video that we did for the games was directed by Joe. And he has a theatrical background, but he was working as a producer at Westwood before we really got into the filming the video stuff. So we had the right person on staff already. And then, you know, I don't know where the idea was to have Joe be the main bad guy in Command & Conquer, but um, it certainly worked out well. And, uh, yeah, as you say, he did become the face very much the face of the game and certainly even with some of the ea uh editions of command and conquer that came out you know later on after westwood had closed down kane was very much in evidence on the uh the covers and everything so yeah but he was uh he direct basically all of the live action that we did was directed by joe kukin 
So in addition to being, you know, the sort of arch bad guy in the game, he also was responsible for filming all of the video that was in the game. And, you know, there was some pretty, uh, we, we actually had a green screen in the, it was a full size green screen in the building inside the, the, the Westwood office. And so we would, you know, have big name actors come in like, uh, you know, Tiberian Sun had James Earl Jones, uh, Blade Runner game had Sean Young in it. Michael Bain from uh, Terminator and Aliens was in uh, Tiberian Sun. And you would see these guys in the hallway randomly as they were walking through to the green screen. So you never knew who you were going to bump into walking down the hallway. Yeah, I was going to say, like, yeah, James Earl Jones in um, Tiberian Sun was yeah. wicked. And, and, yeah. and the acting was really kind of stepped up in that game. When it came out, um, were, were there many complaints from people because they were expecting Red Alert 2 and it was a bit of a change in direction and storyline? No, I didn't perceive that so much. I uh, I will say, you know, I think it was, uh, let's get this right, I think it was 1997 that uh, EA purchased, 90, sorry, 1998 when EA purchased Westwood. And at that time, we were in development in Tiberian Sun. I think it was August of 98 that EA bought the company. And they were clearly expecting this game to come out and do well. So there was pressure in that sense, in the sense that, you know, we needed to ship this thing soon. In the end, it actually took another year after that to get the game finished. I think we underestimated, you know, like how difficult some of the things that we were trying to do would be to do. And we sort of bit off a pretty big chunk with that. And um, quite a few of the ideas that we had for tech and the sort of interactions with design, it just wasn't possible, you know, to sort of uh, uh, build them into the game because of the time pressure. And uh, there, there's a lot of cool stuff on the cutting room floor there. We had like one of the things that we did uh, for enemy AI, because in previous games it had been pretty non-intelligent uh, artificial intelligence. We did a thing where we did not only uh, pathfinding so that you know a, a unit could find its way across the map, but we added a layer which was a threat rating for every map cell. So you could have... Uh, Units travel across the map, not only avoiding obstacles, but avoiding threat as well, which was great, except <laughs> it was uh, it proved exceedingly difficult for the designers to build these levels because the AI <laughs> would do stuff that they hadn't planned. <laughs> so while it sounds cool on paper to have, like, for example, the AI would build an APC and load it with units and then send them around the back of your base, avoiding threat. Which was amazing, except the designers didn't want that to happen because they couldn't balance for that. And, and there was no that's time. That's how a lot of uh, players ended up playing online. As well. And that's, yeah, totally. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's um, in a way, it makes the enemy more human. It kind of does some, at least it starts to, you know, move in that direction. But we couldn't use it because, uh, like I said, we realized we'd bitten off a lot with that. And um, we couldn't, we just, there was just no time to balance for that. And so we had to take it out of the game. But it was done and working, and it was cool. We, we played a few multiplayer games with that enabled, and it was uh, always fun to see what the AI came up with, you know. It was, it was a real step up in technology as well because of just the high resolutions, the like, dynamic lighting, and being able to kind of transform units. Was, was this kind of a task to take it into the uh, higher resolutions and uh, you know, much, much better quality on, on new systems? Yeah, we were in a, uh, a period of time where we, it was a time when um, there was really the prevalence of a 3D video card couldn't be depended on. So you couldn't build a game that required a 3D card because they just weren't, the install base wasn't big enough. That changed pretty quickly and it took, uh, I think, a lot of people by surprise, including us at Westwood with some of the future stuff that we did. But um, so we had to build Tiberian Sun for software, you know, like a, a, a computer system without a 3D card. So that's why we built the voxel technology for the units. So they're, they're 3D in the sense that they can sort of uh, rotate around and 
they don't. It's but it's all done in software and does not require a three D card. You know, but clearly there's a lot of effort to build one of those a system like that from scratch, and it's just an example of where I think we sort of underestimated just how difficult it would be to do all the things that we wanted to do. And I think actually um, Red Alert 2, which basically took the Tiberian Sun engine and then iterated on that for a year, was kind of a similar situation to the original Red Alert with Command and Conquer in that, you know, you can take this thing, you can see, you know, how people out there in, in the world are, are playing, you know, Tiberian Sun, see how that's going, see where some of the problems are, and then have a very targeted list of things to fix. And that's what happened with Red Alert 2. And it actually was, Red Alert 2 was developed in our satellite studio in Irvine, California, which was basically the remains of Virgin Interactive. So when EA bought Westwood, that little piece of Virgin came with. So we sort of renamed that office Westwood Pacific. And th those guys took, you know, they basically led the production on Red Alert 2. And they took the game. They had a look at what was working, what wasn't working, and really had a very targeted list of things that they did with it very successfully, I think. And uh, we had, you know, the sort of key engineers in, in the Las Vegas office were also attached to that project. But they did things like they increased the scale of the units, for example, to make them clearer. And then they dropped certain things like, uh, so uh, Tiberian Sun had a sort of uh, lighting effect on the terrain, which was cool, but didn't add, like it looked really cool, but it, it didn't add a tremendous amount to the gameplay, so they, they dropped that. So they, they were able to very sort of surgically take things that didn't work, remove them, or improve them strategically. And f with the benefit of all of the player feedback, you know, from T Tiberian Sun in this case, in a very short space of time, kick out a whole new game, a whole new set of units, a whole new, you know, continuing the Red Alert sort of uh, storyline. And uh, I thought they did a great job with that. Yeah, I, I think Red Alert 2 was amazing. Like, um, the, the, the fact that you could have such small units, especially like Tanya, that could uh, be, you know, one unit that could come in and destroy a whole base. It, it completely changed the balance of the game. Oh, yeah. No, they definitely had a different approach to balance. I think they described it as balancing high and balancing for fun, you know. And, yeah, Tanya was, like, the first, I think, the first mission in the game. You got to play with Tanya, and she just killed everybody. And it was cool. Like, you felt, you know, powerful in the game, and it was, it was a great intro to that game, I think. Well, obviously, Renegade was a complete change being an FPS. What did you think of that title? I thought it was amazing with, with caveats. <laughs> so um, Renegade took about five years to build. So I think we started it at the end of 1996 or beginning of 97, and it came out in 2002. It was actually the last game I worked on at Westwood. There were some real high points with that game, and there were some sort of issues with it. Obviously, you know, taking five years is kind of an issue. One of the reasons for that was the thing I sort of mentioned earlier, which is when the game development kicked off, you couldn't build a game that needed a 3D card. You could support 3D cards, but, you know, your market would be very limited if you made that a requirement. And so that's how Renegade was, uh, development was kicked off. And, uh, yeah, so we had to build 3D tech that would run, you know, in a effective and performant way on a machine that didn't have a uh, 3D card. And we did that. We actually licensed an engine called Surrender that was built by a company in Finland called Hybrid. And they their uh, Surrender engine did support uh, hardware 3D cards, but their claim to fame was the performance of their software renderer. And so we started off down that road. We built a lot of the game and the game assets, but at the same time, 3D cards were really taken off. And so at a point about maybe a half or two thirds of the way into development, we were building a game for basically the previous generation of you know 
graphics expectations, if you want to put it that way. Uh, so one of the problems with the game is like we couldn't start over. There just wasn't enough time or budget to start over and sort of improve the quality of the models and the textures. Um, I mean, some of that was done, but there was, it's a fairly big game and there's a lot in it. And so I think it definitely suffered when it did come out. And we did, you know, we did make that pivot to make it a 3D uh, hardware required game. But it, it kind of suffered by comparison with some of the, you know, some of its contemporary games that came out. Now, on the flip side of it, the multiplayer in that game was freaking amazing. And I think, uh, when, like, it was, I had the same feeling with that game that I had with Command and Conquer when everyone would stay behind after work to play it. You know, you could play a game with 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 people, and the gameplay dynamics really stood up well. But it was a completely different game to the solo game. I mean, it was it was night and day. And, you know, the solo game kind of wanted to be more like the multiplayer game, but we, you know, again, everything was baked. It was just too late to change it. So I think uh, when that game came out, the solo part of the game just didn't stand up well enough, and I, that reflected in the sales. But the multiplayer was amazing. And I think some of the ideas that we had did sort of, I think EA had a decision to make at a certain point as to where they were going to put their money, you know, and they had the Battlefield game and they had the uh, Medal of Honor and they kind of went that way. And we, we actually had built a prototype of Renegade 2. We weren't uh, at that point technology constrained. We were basically, you know, sort of art constraints. So we, we built a uh, Renegade 2 demo that looked amazing, as good as anything else that was out there, but it just didn't get funded by EA. It was yeah. an interesting concept because, you know, you've always played games like SimCity, and I even remember to the point of a theme park, you used to be able to go on the rides and, like, see it from the, you know, the perspective of somebody playing. And uh, it was yeah. it was really interesting to see kind of Command & Conquer go down that route. And um, wasn't there apparently a, a Command & Conquer MMO as well that ended up getting <clears throat> cancelled? Yeah, there was. Um, it was called Continuum. And there were a number of things going on at that time. EA were doing their whole EA.com thing, which I don't think really ever went anywhere. And, uh, you know, it's basically right across the company. And EA.com EA was sort of a... They, they were actually going to spin that off as a, a separate company at one time. So there's a big investment in everything online. So Westwood were doing Earth and Beyond and CNC Continuum. And both had sort of kicked off at about the same time. But there was too much to do. We didn't have enough people or the really the budget to do two games at once. When we realized how big those games are, when you actually come right down to it and you have to you know build them, so we said, okay, we'll focus on Earth and Beyond. And that will be our first one. And if it goes wrong, then at least we didn't kind of sully the Command & Conquer name. Hopefully it goes right, right? So that's, that's kind of how it went down. Yeah, so Continuum was shelved. And the thought was that we would get back to it after Earth and Beyond had shipped. But of course, you know, that never happened and Westwood was closed down before they had an opportunity to do that, basically. Well, w would you like to see a, a kind of return of uh, the Command & Conquer series and and any new titles coming out, maybe a finally Generals 2 or something like that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I guess there's always room for someone to do a new take on things. Um, I, I mean, a, a few of the things that EA, they had the mobile game, that you know tried to do the sort of uh, clash royale type gameplay and it, it was it sort of had a mixed reception i think there's always room to do something else but i think a lot of times though i think the people out there kind of look at what the most recent thing you did was and you know that sort of colors their opinion on anything new that you do but mm -hmm. uh yeah i mean i you know i would love to see a new command and conquer game but i <laughs> probably won't involve me you know well steve has been you know incredible reminiscing about i think you know we covered uh got from the, the zx81 up to uh <laughs> the cnc remaster in that last hour yep. so hell of a lot that we covered there i mean what what are you up to these days then and are you, are you still like interested in the rts universe 
Uh, am I interested? I am interested, yeah. I'm currently not doing games as my day job. A couple of years ago, I co-founded Overland Bound, which is basically a platform and community around vehicle-based overland travel. You know, so I'm CTO and lead engineer, getting my hands dirty right up to my shoulders in code every day and loving it. And um, it's not uh, games. It actually uses, funnily enough, it actually uses a lot of the tech. It's basically the LAMP stack that, you know, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Um, and that, that was used in the last RTS that I did work on, which was at Kixi, where I think I was at Kixi from 2013 to 2017, about five years, working on the Battle Pirates game, which is, you know, massively multiplayer RTS played in the browser. And yeah. That, you know, and it was like I was staggered by how popular and successful that game was, not necessarily through my efforts, but, you know, we, were ten, we would have tens of thousands of people playing that game simultaneously. So, yeah, I mean, I did that for five years. So it's, that was about, uh, what, four or five years ago that I uh, uh, left Kixi, I guess, but did work on that for a number of years. Um, I am still involved as a sort of side slash passion project on a couple of things. And uh, one of those is creating a version of Nodes of Yesod for the ZX Spectrum Next. So nice. I had committed to doing that at the time of the original Kickstarter, which was a few years ago now. But through, you know, IRL in real life things like moving jobs twice. I never actually started on that until recently, but I am, I am now putting in a good amount of time on that, uh, like I said, as a passion project. And I, I want to do more after that as well in the sort of retro kind of scene, as it were. And also, I've been fairly actively updating my blog, which is at steveweatherill.com, going basically chronologically you know, through my career, I'm up to about 1988 so far, so I have a few years to go on that one. Well, Steve, it's been incredible reminiscing with you, and actually, I'm waiting for my um, Spectrum next as well. You know, I was one of the Kickstarter backers in the second round, so yeah, yeah me I'm too. Looking forward to checking that out. So yeah, yeah I have fantastic. one of those coming. I have uh, one from the first batch, and I have a dev board as well. So I certainly, uh, you know, I'm not not blocked from developing on that hardware. It is pretty cool. It is. Yeah, cool. definitely. It, really it is. Wonderful. Well, Steve, thank you so much for coming on. Obviously, I'll, I'll link up your website and I'll show notes if people want to read more about your, your blog on there. Yeah. And I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to uh, reminisce with us today. Yeah, Dan and Ravi, thank you much for uh, chatting with me. It's always fun to talk about some of the old times and some of the less old times as well. Yeah.